This morning's scripture comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 2. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not seen. For therein the elders had witness born to them. Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 2. Good morning. If you are two to four, you can go ahead and head out those double doors right there by Mr. Tim and go on to toddler time. If you are older than four, you're stuck with me for the next 25-ish minutes. That's the goal, anyway. This morning we're talking about the idea of faith. Faith is one of those words that when you say it, you have a lot of ideas of what you bring to that word. In context, you think about the idea of belief, or you think about the idea of a shot in the dark, hoping something is there. But as we read in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, it's the substance of the conviction that we have. I've run into a lot of uh, illustrations or definitions, rather, of what faith truly is. I've got some quotes here for you to consider as we talk about the idea of faith and applying that faith to the idea of Abraham. The idea of faith can be defined in this way. Faith consists of persistent hope in the promises of God, and it is such faith that obtains salvation on the last day. I like that. It's not too wordy. It kind of gets right to the point of what we're talking about. And we have the idea of this faith not just being a shot in the dark or a hope or the idea of just simply believing in something, but it's that persistent hope that we have despite difficulties in life that we trust in God no matter what life will bring us. I think I see Luke taking a tour of the auditorium. Don't mind him. He's a man on a mission, getting tissues. All right. Faith. I find this second definition to be a little bit wordier, but maybe a bit clearer. Biblical faith is a confident trust in the eternal God who is all-powerful, infinitely wise, and eternally trustworthy. The God who has revealed himself in his word and in the person of Jesus Christ whose promises have been proven true from generation to generation and who will never leave nor forsake his own. These two definitions, again, this kind of help us uh, mentally fill in the gaps of what we bring to the table when we say the idea of just simply faith. And so for this morning, what I want to do is talk about the idea of living a life of faith, how we are to do that, not just simply hoping or believing or thinking that God is there, but how to confidently walk through life with faith by looking to those generations of old that give us a good example. And no better place could I go this morning to talk about the idea of living by faith than the book of Hebrews chapter 11. So we'll be covering the entirety of Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. If you know Hebrews 11, we'll be here for the next three hours. I'm just kidding, folks. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 8, we're just talking about Abraham this morning. Aren't you feeling happy that we kind of narrowed down our choices? Right? Yeah. Okay, just Abraham, just Abraham, the father of the faithful, right? The idea of looking in verses 8 through 16, we're going to be tracking what the Hebrews author has to say about living through faith, just like Abraham did, kind of getting a bird's eye view of what his life looked like. Now, what I would have loved to have done is go into Genesis and go through the life of Abraham. But again, if you don't want to be here for three hours, I had to narrow my scope of what I hope to accomplish. So, Hebrews 11, 8 through 16 is it. That's, that's the best case scenario for you this morning, is Hebrews chapter, eight, uh, verse, uh, chapter 11, verses 8 through 16. Let's begin reading. By faith... 
Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. But he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to uh, the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was well past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. And therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Verses 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. As we make our way through this text, the Hebrews author is trying to enumerate all the people of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament we call it, those people who lived by faith. And if you'll notice, all of the examples of the individuals mentioned in the Hall of Fame of Faith, Hebrews 11, all of them begins with the idea of by faith, so-and-so, Abraham, for example, verb, they did something because of their faith. It wasn't simply just an idea of believing what God said or acknowledging that he was present or he existed even. It's the idea that they were so trusting in the promises of God, they did something, and that's called faith here, in Hebrews chapter 11. So the first thing I want to make very clear here is when I say that we ought to live by faith, I really mean we ought to live as a verb by faith. Not just simply mentally acknowledge that he exists or that he is true or the Bible says true or good things for us, but we are called to do something, live, through the idea of faith, trusting in his promises that what he said will come to pass because Abraham as a great example believed God knew his promises were true and lived in that kind of way as we go through the text here of Hebrews chapter 11 verses 8 through 16 you could slice this any way you wanted what happens with me biblically is as I go through a text I kind of see how naturally it unfolds then use that to kind of build a stepping stone for you to follow my thoughts throughout the Bible. It's kind of like if you've ever cooked really, really good filet mignon before. Now, I'm a preacher, so I don't make the most money in the world, but every now and again, I'll go to a store and just treat myself with a way too expensive cut of filet mignon. You don't get a whole lot of meat, but it's so good, it's worth it. And when you cook that steak just perfectly, you don't even need a knife. You don't even need a butter knife to slice open that filet mignon. You know what you need? A fork. And you just push on it and it naturally unfolds for you. That's a beautiful steak. The best thing God ever made was that right there. <laughs> now the Bible in a similar way, if you just read it and you allow those words to just rest for the proper amount of time in your mind, you don't need to have a concordance or a dictionary or a commentary. You just look at it and it just naturally unfolds before your eyes. That's beautiful in the Word of God. And thankfully, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 16, if you just think about those words and how they're connected and fit together properly, you just notice something and it just naturally unfolds before you. Here's what I mean. Just look at the verbs of this context, verses 8 through 16. If you just look at the verbs themselves, what did Abraham do 
because he was living by faith. Well, in verse 8, part A, the first section, the first clause of that verse, he obeyed, didn't he? God called him to leave his country, leave his father's house, leave the place where he was comfortable, and to go out to a land where he didn't know where it was or what was in there besides God saying, this would be your land. He obeyed. In the second clause of verse 8, what else did he do living by faith? He went out. He went away from the places that he knew where he was comfortable, his father's house. He took his whole family with him and they went out. In verse 9, he went to live. Now, not in a great palace, but in tents, waiting for the promises of God to come to pass. He lived in that land that God promised to give to him and his ancestors as an inheritance. In verse 10, what else did he do? They were looking forward. They were looking forward to the, the promises of God being fulfilled in their lifetime. They were waiting with anticipation, looking forward to the time that God promised. In the first part of verse 13, what else did Abraham do? Well, he died. It's a verb, technically. They died in faith. He was still waiting, ex expecting the promises to be fulfilled, and they definitely were, though not in his lifetime. In the second clause of verse 13, what else did the people that lived by faith did? They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims, or exiles in the ESV. Did you know I was going to mention that, Ted? Now, did you really know? You didn't know? You just guessed on this Strangers and Pilgrims song? I told him yesterday, he says, hey, what's your text? And I go, Hebrews 11, living by faith, looking at Abraham, and he pulled that out. It was just song about the idea of being strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Double this man's salary right here, okay? <laughs> They confessed that as they were traveling through the so-called promised land to Abraham, that it just didn't fit what they were looking for. I mean, the land of Canaan is great and all. They've got olive trees. They've got some coastline. They've got a Jordan River, a Sea of Galilee. It's got some good stuff on it. Great. But it's not what they were expecting, not what they were waiting for. They didn't feel at home in the land of Canaan. Verse 14, why? Because they were seeking a homeland, looking for the place of God, a land for which they called home. And then ultimately in verse 16, part A, they were desiring a better country. They were looking for something better than what the so-called promised land had to offer. So again, just like that beautiful creation of God, the filet mignon, you press on this text Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 16, it just naturally unfolds for you. You see all the verbs of what these people did in the Old Testament. Living by faith, they did all these things. And that leads us through their entirety of their lives. But also, if you look on this text, if you push on the filet mignon a different way, it unfolds in this way. Instead of looking at what Abraham did, look at what God did. In verse 8, God called Abraham to go out, to leave the comfort and safety and security of his hometown to go to the hometown of the faithful. We see that revealed to us in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, when God called Abraham to go out and leave Haran, leave the Ur of Chaldees, and go out to this land that he didn't know existed. We also see in verse 10, in the very last clause of verse 16, that God built and made a city. Ironically enough, we see Abraham going through the promised land as a traveler, as a stranger, as a, a, a vagabond throughout the promised land. There is no great city that God built. It's not a literal, physical city that he built, but he did build a city. And because he was desiring to see that city, in verse 16, in the middle clause, God was not ashamed of what they did. So again, looking at this text, 
looking to how to live by faith. We look into Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 16, and we see that Abraham is held up as a model, an example of someone who lived by faith because of what he did. So how do we apply this particular lesson to our own lives? Well, I don't just have one Dave slide today. I've got four of them. Y'all ready? You ready, Dave? Okay, verse four. <laughs> Number one, what do we learn? Like Abraham, how do we apply it? We should obey God. Abraham was told by God to go out and leave his father's household. And what did Abraham do? He did it. He obeyed God. We are to leave our comfort and security behind. If we love him, we should listen to him. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's the idea that if we trust that the Creator God knows what is best for us, His children in this world, what He tells us to do is in our own best interests. And because we love Him, we trust in Him, we have that faith in Him, we will obey what He tells us to do. What else do we learn? Number two, we are to go out. We are to go out. We are told to go out into the world and let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our God who is in heaven. But as we go out into the world, we have to keep in mind the reality that we are to influence the world with the love of God, not let the world influence us to be like it. Over in 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 15, John writes these words, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, desires of the eye, eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. We should obey God. He knows what is in our best interest. If we love him, we will obey his commandments. But we're also told to go out into the world to shine that light before men. Third, like Abraham, we should be looking forward. Looking forward. The idea of them looking forward to finally seeing that city that was built by God, never truly finding it in their lifetime, that points to us. Looking forward for that city that is built by God, we will live forever with him. But Paul had that same mindset of looking forward to the idea of even going to his death. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, Paul says these words, I am hard-pressed between the two. What he means is, I can't make my mind up which one is better, to live or die. That's what he's talking about in the context. Now, why does he say that? My desire is to, to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. He says, I'm ready to go. I know Christ is waiting for me. I'm looking forward to the time where I can die and go be with my Lord. Now, it's a bit morbid in some aspects, but it's also so hopeful. You've got a man here in prison for being a follower and a teacher of Jesus the Christ. And he says, if they kill me, good. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to be with my Lord who is waiting for me just on the other side of this life. What a hopeful way to go through the world, living by faith, knowing what is in your future. Life is so full of uncertainty, and it wants to scare you almost to death. But folks, when we live by faith, there is nothing this world can throw at us that should scare us. Why? Because we know who's forward of us, who's right in front of us. Also, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we find this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, I think it's referring to all the heroes in chapter 11. All those folks that we look to as role models for living by faith, 
They're witnesses, if you will, of what we're going through. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Verse 2, don't miss it. Looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, in front of him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The author here is saying, now that you've been told how all these heroes of your faith lived by faith, you live by faith. And it's like running a race. You put off all the excess weight on your body, and you look at the finish line. Who is the finish line, folks? Jesus the Christ. Who did Paul have before him as he was running the race of the Christian life? Jesus. He knew where the finish line was, to be with him forever. Abraham did that in an ancient way. He was looking forward to the promises of God being fulfilled. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed in you, in your descendants. He was looking forward to that promise. Do you know how all the nations of the earth were blessed? Because Jesus the Christ came through his bloodline. The Messiah was born through Abraham's seed. I want to say finally, but I don't mean it. Finally, what do we learn? Like Abraham, we should confess that we just don't feel at home in this world. Are you comfortable in this life? You shouldn't be. Something's wrong with it. Something's wrong with it. It's not what God intended it to be. We are not what God intended us to be. To live in this world and rule it in his stead, to be image bearers of the divine, something's wrong with this world. It's just, it's just not quite what we were hoping for. If you feel that way, you're in good company. Over in Psalm 39, verse 12, David says this, Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my cry, hold not your peace at my tears. Why? Because I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. Now, David wrote this. He was the king of all Israel, living in the promised land, ruling over the people of God who had the Torah, who had the law, who knew who God was. He was the king in Jerusalem. And he said, I just don't feel like this is what the world's supposed to be like. I'm just traveling through it as a stranger. He wasn't comfortable in this world. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, Peter felt this way. He walked with Jesus, and he didn't feel comfortable here either. 1 Peter 2, 11, Beloved, I urge you as travelers, sojourners, and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Something's wrong, folks, with this world. If you feel comfortable here, something is terribly wrong. Abraham didn't feel comfortable. David didn't feel comfortable. Peter didn't feel comfortable. Jesus didn't feel comfortable. Because there's something else awaiting us. Just on the other side. And we can reach it if we live by faith. Like Abraham, we should obey God. We should go out. We should look forward and confess that we don't feel at home in this world. Why? Because just like Abraham did all those things in Hebrews 11, 8 through 16, God also did certain things. We learn that because God has called us to go out. He's called us to go out to the world 
to share the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of his son. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul says that they were sent out to preach to the world, and they did that. They told the ancient world who the Messiah was. And then we're told, we have a place waiting for us. Let's go to John chapter 14. This will be our final lease statement, John chapter 14. Now, unfortunately, it seems like I only ever go here during a funeral service. It's one of my favorite ones to give us comfort and to give us hope. When someone's passed away, you talk about the place prepared. Well, folks, as far as I know, we're all still alive and kicking in this room. <laughs> but there's a prepared place for each and every one of us. John 14, verse 1 let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know where I'm going. And then, not Peter, but Thomas spoke up and said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Verse 6, Jesus said, Thomas, I am the way and the peace and the life. No one comes to the Father except through or by me. We look at Abraham's life we see in the hall of fame of faith what it took for him to make it on that list. He believed in the promises of God and his life reflected it. We look to him as a hero of faith because of how he lived his life. And we are called to live just like him, living by faith. If anyone has a need, to come forward this morning to ask for prayers of strength and encouragement. You can come forward and talk to me or you can see one of our shepherds at the doors. If you have a need to respond and to live by faith, do so now as we stand and we sing.